We turn to Genesis chapter 42. This is lesson number six in our study of the life of Joseph. Just as Joseph said, the seven years of abundance would uh, end and uh, seven years of famine would begin. And the famine was so bad, and not just in Egypt, but in other countries as well. And so that sets the stage then for the reunion of Joseph and his brothers. Chapter 42 then, uh, when Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, uh, he sent his sons to go and buy some food. And our text gives us an interesting description of the conversation that Jacob had with his sons. Genesis 42, starting at verse 1. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, and Jacob said to his sons, can't you just picture this, why are you staring at one another? He said, behold, I've heard that there is grain in Egypt, so go down there and buy some for us from that place so we may live and not die. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt, but Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I am afraid that harm may befall him. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. It appears as if Joseph's brothers were, I guess, a bit hesitant in going to Egypt. And I guess you can understand why. It was a, a long journey, um, probably a dangerous trip. Uh, no guarantee of, of being accepted by the Egyptians. And notice that, that Jacob sent all of his sons except Benjamin. Why didn't he want Benjamin to go? Well, I think it's pretty clear. Uh, Benjamin, as with Joseph, was the son of Rachel, and Rachel was the one that uh, he loved the most, and, and he wanted to, to marry her. And although he had no clear knowledge of what had happened to Joseph, he just may have sensed that uh, these brothers were responsible for Joseph's death. And so uh, he's thinking, nah, I'm not going to send Benjamin there. Last time I sent uh, Joseph to be with his brothers, it didn't end very well. Jacob was again uh, showing signs of favoritism just as he did with uh, Joseph now with, with Benjamin. And it was pretty obvious to the brothers, and he probably should have learned that that just doesn't work. Um, uh, the history of his family proves that. So as the governor of the land, Joseph was in charge uh, of the grain. Uh, he must have had many other uh, people working for him, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that grain was stored in cities all over Egypt. It couldn't have been just in one place. So what are the chances that in coming to Egypt for food that Joseph's brothers would actually meet Joseph? Uh, probably not very good. But guess who they meet? They come face to face with Joseph. And I'd suggest to you that uh, this is another uh, clear evidence of, of the providence of God that God was working in this situation, leading and guiding in the background. And we don't see God's name mentioned in this, but I think it's pretty clear that God was involved in this. And when they saw a Joseph, it's quite interesting to notice what they did. Verse 6, now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came, and notice this, and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Now, it's obvious what is significant about this. Uh, they obviously didn't realize it at the time, but they were fulfilling the dream of Joseph. Back in chapter 37, remember he said that his brothers would bow down to him, and they said, oh, yeah, right, yeah, you're, we're going to bow down to you. Well, they did. They were fulfilling the dream of Joseph, and they didn't even didn't even realize it. And I want you to notice how Joseph responded to them. We begin then at verse 7 of chapter 42. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them. How could he not? But he disguised himself to them and spoke 
to them harshly. And he said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had about them and said to them, you are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Then they said to him, no, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. Yet he said to them, no, but you have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. But they said, your servants are 12 brothers in all, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no longer alive. Not true. Joseph said to them, it is as I said to you, you are spies. Now, why was Joseph harsh with them? I guess we could put it that way. Uh, was he trying to pay them back for what they had done to him? That might be the first response we would think of, but no, no, that wasn't the case. Uh, Joseph wanted to see if their hearts had changed, if they were different from what they were like when, when they sold him into slavery. So he brought them through a series of tests. And what we see here in chapter 42 is how Joseph, he tested their honesty. They claimed to be honest, but Joseph knew them. He, he knew their past. Honest men, um, hardly. But verse 13 gives us another reason. They had told him that one of their brothers is no longer alive. Obvious re reference to Joseph. So Joseph wanted to know if they were honest about Benjamin. If they had lied about Joseph, were, there be, were they being honest about Benjamin? Or had they gotten rid of him too? How was Joseph going to find out? Well, first of all, he did seek to find out by sending one of them back to Canaan to bring Benjamin to Egypt. Verse 15, he says, By this you will be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not go from this place unless your youngest brother comes here. So one of you, or excuse me, send one of you that he may get your brother while you remain confined, that your words may be tested, whether there is truth in you. But if not, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. Joseph wasn't going to let them go until they brought Benjamin back. So he put them in prison for three days, according to verse 17. Give them a chance to think about it a little bit. And those days, those three days, must have been very, very long days. I wonder what they talked about during that time. It would be interesting to have recorded here uh, some of their, their conversation. So on the third day, uh, Joseph said something that may have shocked them. Verse 18, now Joseph said to them on the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. They had said nothing about God, but Joseph did. And this may have been his way of getting them to think about what they had done and causing them to think about their need to get right with God. So he mentions the Lord. He says, do this and live, for I am a man that fears God. So the second thing Joseph did to test them was by demanding that one of them stay in Egypt while they get Benjamin. So here's a, really a, a change in, in uh, what he had asked them to do. He changed from demanding uh, one to go and, and get Benjamin to having one stay while the rest were allowed to to go. He wanted to see if they had really changed. Would they leave one of their brothers in Egypt and go home never to return? Would the brothers treat another one of their family like they had treated him? That's what Joseph wanted to know. Um, he was disposable in their eyes. Would another brother be disposable in their eyes? 
Now it appeared as if their hearts were softening. Verse 21, then they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them saying, did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy and you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. So notice they began to confess their sin to one another. They saw that what was happening in their lives now was God's just judgment. Their attitude toward Joseph was changing. Back in Genesis chapter 37, verse 19, they had called him the dreamer. And now they were calling him our brother. I would suggest to you that that was the work of God. That was a change in their lives that God was, was bringing about. Uh, Joseph's brothers were experiencing what uh, one preacher describes as the grace of guilt. <laughs> the grace of guilt. What makes this so interesting is that they didn't realize that Joseph was listening. Verse 23 says, They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. That was part of the, the disguising of himself, is by having an interpreter, rather than speaking to them in their language, he had an interpreter, a part of the disguisal. Notice how this affected Joseph when he heard what they were saying. Verse 24 says, He turned away from them. And he wept. Interesting, there are six times in the book of Genesis where we find Joseph weeping. Besides this one, he wept when he saw his brother Benjamin. He wept when he revealed himself to his brothers. He wept when he met his father in Egypt. He wept when his father died. And when he assured his brothers that they were truly forgiven, he wept. What makes a person weep? I think is a good test of character. What is it that you cry about? Why do you weep? Uh, we learn something about Joseph's heart here by seeing what, what made him cry. Now Joseph told Simeon, or chose Simeon to be the one that would be left behind. And it kind of causes us to ask the question, why Simeon? I mean, he could have chosen one of the other brothers, but he chose Simeon. Now, Reuben was the firstborn, so maybe he, he, he could have been a, a choice, a likely choice. Uh, but Reuben was the one who attempted to rescue him from his brothers. And Joseph had just heard that uh, as he listened to them uh, talking with one another. Simeon was the number two son, so maybe that's why he was... Uh, chosen. And Simeon was also known to be a, a cruel man. Uh, Simeon and Levi had done a detestable thing to a group of people. And um, maybe it was Joseph's way to teach him a lesson. Um, and so he chooses a Simeon. So he continued to test their honesty then by, by putting their silver back in their bags, the money that they had brought to get food, as they were going back to Canaan now, uh, he put their silver back in their bags. Verse 25, then Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to restore every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for their journey. And thus it was done for them. So they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed from there. Notice how they responded to this. Verse 27, as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money, and behold, it was in the mouth of his sack. Then he said to his brothers, my money has been returned, and behold, it is even in my sack. And their hearts sank, <laughs> and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? Their hearts were continuing to soften. As God was bringing about here a conviction of, of sin, 
And it's interesting, this is the first time in the narrative that they mention the Lord. What is this that God has done for us? But you know, the work of God within them was not done yet. We see that in what they said to their, their father Jacob when they got back to the land of Canaan. Verse 29, when they came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man, the Lord of the land, spoke harshly with us and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no longer alive, and the youngest is with our father today in the land of Canaan. The man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I will know that you are honest men. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households and go. But bring your youngest brother to me that I may know that you are not spies, but honest men. Notice how many times honest is mentioned here. I will give your brother to you and you may trade in the land. Now, it's not so much what they said here that is the problem. The problem is what they left unsaid. They could have been honest with Jacob about what they had done with Joseph. This could have been a time where they said, Dad, we need to tell you something. But they didn't. It's obvious that God had more work to do in their lives. After Jacob's sons explained to him what had happened in Egypt, something, something shocking happened. Verse 35 says, Now it came about as they were emptying their sacks, that behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. And when they and their father saw their bundles of money, they were dismayed. <laughs> now here's where it really gets interesting. What does Jacob's response reveal about what he thinks has happened to Joseph? Look at verse 36. Their father said to Jacob, listen carefully, you have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more and Simeon is no more and you would take Benjamin. All these things are against me. Jacob seems to be putting the blame on his sons for what happened to Joseph. <laughs> you have bereaved me of my children, he says. And he also made it pretty clear what he felt about them compared to what he felt about Benjamin. Shouldn't surprise us. Evidently, he hadn't learned from what favoritism does to a family. And then notice uh, Reuben, trying to be helpful, uh, but makes a very ridiculous statement, a ridiculous solution to the problem. Verse 37, then Reuben spoke to his father saying, you may put my two sons to death. If I do not bring him back to you, put him in my care and I will return him to you. What good would that do? Dad, if I don't bring Benjamin back, you can kill your two grandsons. It's just like, really? How, how ridiculous can you get? And yet people say some, some foolish things sometimes when they're trying to come up with some kind of a solution to, to a problem. Well, Jacob was clearly not in favor of sending Benjamin to Egypt. He told his sons that if something happened to Benjamin, it would kill him. Verse 38, but Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he alone is left as if there were no other brothers. If harm should befall him on the journey you are taking, then you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. So there's a couple of lessons I think we need to really uh, take from this uh, chapter. The first lesson is pretty obvious that nothing good comes from favoritism in a family. Now, this was part of the reason why Joseph's brothers sold him in the first place. Yet Jacob, he just didn't seem to learn from that. After Joseph was gone, then Benjamin became his favorite son. And, and all, his, all his other sons knew it. They saw it. It was pretty clear. 
First Joseph, then, then, then Benjamin. And I mentioned before that this, this was a generational problem. It started with Abraham favoring Isaac over Ishmael. It continued with Isaac favoring Esau over Jacob. And now Jacob favoring Joseph and Benjamin over the rest of his sons. It's a foolish thing for us as parents to show favoritism. It just does not result in, in, in anything good. Nothing good comes from favoritism in a family. A second uh, lesson that's pretty clear here too is that we reap what we sow. It's interesting how Joseph's brothers recognized this when they went to Egypt to look for food. They saw what was happening to them as a sign that God was dealing with them. God was repaying them. God was punishing them for what they had done to Joseph. It's a principle that we, we do need to understand that we reap what we sow. It will spare us from great pain if, if we understand and apply that, that principle to our lives. Some people just don't think that they'll ever face any consequences for what they sow in their lives. Here's how Paul puts it. And may we take this to heart. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. We reap what we sow. And it's important that we are sowing in our lives those uh, things that bring blessing, those things that result in, in uh, good in our lives and in the lives of, of others. Let's pray. Father, help us to recognize that principle that we reap what we sow. And as we continue to look at the life of Joseph and see the lessons that you would teach us in this amazing account of a, of a man who was willing to forgive those who had wronged him. And as we see in Joseph a, a beautiful picture of, of Jesus, uh, thank you for your forgiveness, Lord, and how you cleanse us and make us clean in, in your sight. Lord, to you belongs all the praise and the honor and glory. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Spend time in his word. Goodbye.